our presentation today is Slavery at Mount Vernon, and it's being presented by George Washington's Mount Vernon. The Presidential Primary Sources Project is a partnership between Internet2, the National Archives, and the National Park Service. It's a free series we put on every year from January through April. Um, so if you haven't already, check out some of our future programs as well. This is just a quick reminder, by participating today, you are going to be recorded and archived. We do keep recordings of all of our programs on our YouTube channel for students and teachers to access when they have a chance. We're super excited to have you all. We have a big program today, which is great. Um, and we want you to participate as much as possible. Uh, that said, we I just want to go over a few notes about participating. So a main way we'll participate is through the chat. If you haven't already found that, it looks like a little caption bubble. Go ahead and pull that up. Um, you will be able to ask and answer questions through that chat box. You probably want to make sure your name, your display name when you chat is what you want it to be, because that's kind of how we will call on you or refer to you. Um, and that said, just make sure that we're being really respectful of this tool. We want to make sure that we're only asking and answering questions directly related to what our presenter is talking about. Um, we will do our best to get to all your questions, but just know that we might not get to all of them, but we will certainly do our best. There, You can also be on video if you'd like. If you'd like to be on video, like some of our classrooms here. Um, if you can put a note in the chat, I will work with you to get that set up for you. All right. And with that, I just want to thank you again for joining us. We're so excited to have you. Um, this is our website to check out some of our future programs, or if you're looking to find a recordings, you can also find those there. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and pass it over to the person you came to see. Uh, pass it over to Sadie. Thank you so much, Therese. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, I hope you can hear me. My name is Sadie Troy. I can see you waving. Hi, nice to see everyone. Um, and I am the student learning or er, manager of student learning at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, I, uh, as Tree said, um, really would like to keep this uh, interactive as engaging as possible. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and so we are going to be utilizing that chat. Um, there are going to be a lot of chats coming through because this is a really big group. And I know you guys all have a lot of wonderful information to share. Hello. Um, so I'll try my best, but we're going to keep that chat respectful and answering the questions. And if I can't answer them, um, you know, please let your teacher know and we can possibly answer questions after this presentation. But we're going to be together for about 45 minutes or so. So hopefully there's a lot of time um, to answer. And I see some people are on the screen, so we'll allow yourself to unmute so you can verbally give us some answers as well as talking in the chat. But also, if you don't have the option, that's fine. Just, you know, these questions are to be able to be answered to us in the chat or to each other um, in the classroom or home where you're at. So with that, I want to start things off with a little bit of an interactive question. And so I would like just to kind of hear from the very beginning, what do you guys know about George Washington? What are some of the things that you already know about George Washington? Um, so let's go ahead and type that into the chat. And I know we're gonna get, while those answers are coming in, we're gonna get all types of answers because I saw that we have people joining us from New York, from Virginia, which is where I'm calling you from, from George Washington's Mount Vernon. We're right here in Alexandria, Virginia. But then we have people joining from Tennessee, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin. I think I saw Neptune City. I think I saw Pennsylvania. Um, so it's really great to have you all. I'm seeing a lot of answers coming in. He was first president of the United States. I just saw we had somebody joining from New Mexico. This is fantastic. Um, all right, so he was the first president. He was a commander. He was a spy master. Um, that came from Edgewood. Do we have anyone on screen who'd like to say? Trillium, do you have anyone from your class who would like to unmute and tell us a fact you know about George Washington? Go ahead. 
Um, he still has the greatest rank in military history. He still has the greatest rank in military history. That's exactly right. Awesome. They even changed his rank to make sure that stays forever. Um, let's see. Jill said he loved to dance. Gus says he was a general. Um, Bethany said he was our first president. Edgewood, do you want to tell us a fact you know about him? He had fake teeth. He had fake teeth. Yes. And thank you so much for saying he had fake teeth and not wooden teeth because thumbs up, thumbs down on the screen. Did he have wooden teeth or not? No, right? Yeah, that's a myth about him. Yeah, you know, his dentist was named Greenwood and maybe that's where it comes from, but his teeth weren't actually made of wood. They were made of, of uh, metal and horse teeth and human teeth and ivory with metal springs in it. So they were probably very uncomfortable. Um, but, oh, we got so many great answers. So I saw first president, um, Robinson Elementary says he was commander in chief of the Continental Army. Oh, we have someone mentioned that he was in the French and Indian War. So you guys have a lot of really great insight about George Washington, which is awesome. And we can learn about George Washington from textbooks. We can learn about George Washington from movies, from our teachers. We can learn about him from a variety of different sources. Um, I want to talk about the certain types of primary sources. Like, what are some ways if I wanted to know how George Washington Washington felt about certain things. What are different sources I can go to to figure out how George Washington um, felt about being a general or felt about being a president? Where can I, what kind of sources can I read to learn about George Washington from himself or people that directly knew him? Ooh, Janine, I see has his letters. Okay, ooh. Birchwood Blue Hill saying his letters as well. Good answer. Um, let's see, diaries, letters. Oh, I'm seeing someone talking about his journal. Like a lot of great, right? A lot of great different types of primary sources, different documents, his letters, his journals, right? We can get a lot of insight on George Washington himself, how he felt about being the first president, how he felt about being a general, how he felt about being um, a distiller. Somebody had said that he was a distiller because George Washington could read and write. And he left us a lot of written documentation about himself. A lot of newspapers at the time wrote about him. Somebody mentioned battle tactics. Absolutely, like his own documents. Um, but now I have a little, I have another question to ask you and I'm actually gonna share my screen for this one and it might pull up my PowerPoint here. Fingers crossed that it works. All right, so we're talking about these primary sources that George Washington has in his own writing, right? His letters, his diaries, newspaper articles about him giving us all this insight, right? And Kristen said a secret code. He did. Some of you guys knew he was a spy master. So he developed secret codes to pass through the war so we can look at those codes as well. Um, but the next question I want to ask is, how do we learn about people who may not have been able to read and write or who can re like leave us their own documentations about their lives? Um, as we mentioned, one of our topics we're gonna be talking about here today is slavery at Mount Vernon. And so along with being a president and a general, George Washington was also an enslaver. Um, Mount Vernon, the house behind me here, it's known as being his house, but it was also the home of over 300 enslaved people in the year of 1799. This is a graphic of how the population of Mount Vernon looked. Most of these individuals were not able to read and write. They were not able to leave us written records about their own lives, but they're still really important to the history and legacy of George Washington's Mount Vernon. So how can we learn about them? What are different ways that we can learn about individuals who may not have left us their own written records? Okay, I'm seeing someone at Edgewood is saying animations or political cartoons. Um, Janine popped in and said his business and farm documents. 
Edgewood. Um, Edgewood actually just put up a really good one. Do you guys want to unmute and let us know what you just typed in the chat of a way to understand people who can't leave us written records? What was what was one that you shared, Edgewood? Um, you like since they were doing uh like on a plantation, um, which requires like plowing type clearing. Uh, like digging type stuff, there might have been stuff left over. Um, and also in the house, uh, there's probably stuff that had been left over that would have given you a clue on to how um, they had been living. That's a really great one, right? Like uh, objects that are saved and used during their lives and passed down. Um, along with objects, somebody from LMS seventh grade said stories that were shared and passed down. Um, uh, Birchwood Blue said that same thing, family stories that were passed down, objects, records. Um, somebody threw in the chat artifacts, right? Things that are found in the ground, archaeological artifacts. Um, and so, um, and somebody mentioned documents that were prepared by a scribe or for somebody else, family heirlooms. So these are all really great ways. And what I really like is that you all are really kind of sticking with that same idea that we are still learning about enslaved people um, through primary sources, the primary sources just might look a little different than the primary sources that are available about George Washington, because he's writing his own, he's sharing his own, but for the enslaved people, um, you know, we're looking at a variety because primary sources come in the forms of documents like we've been talking about, newspapers, journals, letters, um, but also images and portraits places, actual physical buildings or outside the grounds at the different places where people lived and worked, objects, music, stories, things that were passed down. Um, and all of this is part of our research. And at Mount Vernon, our staff is made up of a lot of different people who study the past, but in different ways, right? They all study it, but in, they use their different skills and different methods to investigate the lives of enslaved people who, again, were very important to the history and who called Mount Vernon home. This was their home for generations as well. And so on staff at Mount Vernon, we have research historians who are studying documents. We have architectural historians who are studying our buildings and how they were built, how they were used. We have our archeologists who are studying those materials found in the ground. We have curators who are studying those objects. And for almost all of the people who were enslaved by George Washington at Mount Vernon, we don't have those firsthand accounts. So it does make it hard more, a little more difficult to learn about their lives, their families, their feelings, but it doesn't make it impossible, right? It means that this team that we have at Mount Vernon are just have to teach themselves to study history a little different. Sometimes that means that they're looking at different sources to pull out that information, right? They are looking at um, sometimes things that come from the ground more than things that were created. Um, sometimes they're looking deeper at things that were built than things that were written down. And as some of you mentioned in the chat, which I was really excited for you sharing, sometimes they have to look at information that were not created by enslaved people or even mention slavery at all, right? Sometimes they're looking at written sources from other people, but they're kind of analyzing and going it a little deeper, right? Sometimes people call this practice reading between the lines. You guys, anyone ever heard of what it means to read between the lines? Anyone wanna kind of explain to us what we think reading between the lines might be? Type it in the chat. Do we have anyone from Madison Junior School or Trillium that would like to ex kind of give us a little bit of idea about what I mean when we say reading between the lines? Paying attention to what there is. That's a really good one. Madison Junior School, what do you want to share? Um, we, um, reading in between the lines is like, don't like 
read like the paragraph, you have to think, what does this mean? Why does it mean this? So you have to think in, outside of the box. You think uh, in the box mostly. That's a really great way to describe it, right? Like thinking outside of the box. Thank you so much. Um, Robinson Elementary said it means something that you see that is not written. Mrs. Bartell's class said using clues. Um, Adams Acad Academy said looking a little closer at things. Um, Mrs. Hort's class said, or paying attention to what isn't there, right? Ollywog, that's a very fun name to say. I really enjoy it. Ollywog said, using information given to figure out more information, right? So you're kind of reading to understand what someone is implying, but may not openly state or write or say it. Edgewood, did you want to follow up with something? It basically just means like to infer something or like kind of guess who like act like using information to guess something. Or yeah. Like Try to figure something out. I think that's a really good word that you used, infer, right? And so, and actually all of this is what we're gonna do today. All right, we're gonna step into the shoes of our different historians. We're gonna investigate different primary sources and we're gonna read between the lines to figure out how we can learn about the lives, the work um, of people who were enslaved and forced to live here at Mount Vernon. Um, we are going to look at three different sources, and I'm going to give you the heads up that all, all three of these sources, not a single one mentions the word slavery, not a single one mentions the word enslaved, um, and most of these were not created um, to even talk about slavery at all. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to break down how they can still provide us with information, right? We're going to use our background knowledge that we have. We're going to use previous experience with studying the past to draw conclusions. Um, but we're going to really understand how historians are going to dive deep. And even if somebody is not explicitly talking about slavery, because it was so ingrained into the culture of George Washington's life and the world he lived in, it's still a part of everything within those sources. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is look at this. We have three sources to look at. We're going to start with a map, and then we're going to go to a diary entry, and then we're going to go to an archaeological artifact. Um, I am going to switch. Let's see if I can do it. Fingers crossed. Let's see if I can pull up a better image of this map really quick. I'm sorry, I thought I had it pulled up, but I wanna pull up an image of the map that we are able to zoom in on. Okay? And as you can see from the title of this map, we have some background information that this is a map of General Washington's farm of Mount Vernon from a drawing transmitted by the general. And who's the general? George Washington, right? So this is a map George Washington drew of Mount Vernon, right? and we can see. And so first thing I want you guys to do is just look at this map. What are things on the map that are standing out to you? Okay, we know it's a map of Mount Vernon, but what are things that are standing out to you? What are you noticing within this map? I can zoom in, I can move things around. Okay, so some things are coming. Um, Michael and Caitlin noticed the large scale of each farm. George said the Potomac River. Um, that's something that popped out to a lot of different people. Um, Edgewood said river, large farm. Um, so the farms are sticking out. Um, there are a lot of farms, rivers in Union. You guys are picking up on names. You're noticing River Farm, Muddy Hole Farm. Um, George said there's lots of farmlands. Mount Vernon Middle School, shout out. What a great name for your middle school. You, um, are, you noticed farms organized around water sources. Look at how much water there is. Um, someone not only noticed that not only was there the Potomac River around it, there's this big kind of crack of a river right in the middle of it. Um, so there's a lot of kind of natural things we're looking at, okay, but this is a map of Mount Vernon. This is a map of the entire plantation. I know we call this house here. I know we call this Mount Vernon, but it was actually an 8,000 acre plantation. And that is what this map 
is of. And in those 8,000 acres, it was divided into all the different farms that you guys are naming. River Farm, Mansion House Farm, Union Farm, Muddy Hole Farm, and Dog Run Farm. Okay, now George Wash, it is surrounded by water too, right? And that water, why is water important to farmland? You guys are very big noticing this river and the creeks around it. Why is the river so important to the farmlands? Who should we... Edgewood, you want to tell us? Looks like we had some volunteer. Um, I think they need... I think they need water for crops and to probably feed the livestock, like give them a drink. Yeah. Also, so they could drink stuff. Right. Absolutely. Water is a very important source. Sunland said they need water for crops. Thank you for that. Someone mentioned irrigation, right? So they need that water for the crops to help the plant grow. And looking at this map here, can you guys, and you need it for people to drink, you need it for animals to drink. Um, can any, you know, looking at if we need a lot of water, do you think that this farm here, Trillium, what would you like to add? Let's have Trillium go. Um, you need, you need water for the like mill. The grist mill. Yeah. Yeah. The That's a, right. You need water not only to feed the plants and grow the crops, you need water to run the industries, right? So that's a really, really great point. And judging by this map here, do you think there are a lot of crops? Do you think there are a little bit of crops? Do you think there's a lot of industry? Do you think there's a little bit of industry? Right, what are we thinking? Based on the size of this map, are we looking at a lot of crops, a little bit? Are we looking at a lot of industry or a little? I am seeing, let's see, Cove School said a lot in all caps of crops. Mrs. Bartell says a lot. Um, Birchwood says a lot. Mount Vernon says a lot. Highland says lots of crops. Yes, okay. In 8,000 acres, there are a ton of crops here. And all of those crops, are gonna be grown kind of in these, Gus even says tons of crops. All of them are gonna be grown within these fields. And if we look, not only does this map tell us where the fields are, right? But it tells us how many acres per field is there. So this one little square right here, field number two has 120 acres of crops. Okay, and that's one of the smaller ones. Field number five right here has 132, right? So water is very important for these crops, okay? And we can see that's just a little bit and there's, that's only one of the farms that we're looking at. So it's a giant amount, all right? Now, what I want you guys to do is we're gonna start, you know, we're gonna start reading between the lines. We're looking at this map and the main story of this map is that it is of George Washington's farm, right? It is of his farm. It's how he divides his acreage and farming is how he made his money. Yes, he was a president. Yes, he was a general. That did not make him money. His money came from the plantation and the work of the enslaved people at Mount Vernon. His money came from the growing of cash crops and wheat. Um, and oh my gosh, as Hector says, you can even see his house, right? So this farm, this is where he lived. This big square down here, okay, that is his house. So here, where he's living on the land, that's where his money comes from, okay? So this map may not have been created to talk about slavery and the institution of slavery at Mount Vernon or enslaved people. But what does this map teach us about slavery? When we look at this, how does this map connect us to slavery even if something is not explicitly written about slavery? What can we learn about slavery at Mount Vernon from looking at this map? Right. Madison Junior School, you want to give us a little piece? Um, so he doesn't farm his own wheat or any crash crop. The slaves do it, and there's a lot of land, so that means he probably has a lot of slaves. 
That's, thank you. That's a very good inference, right? There is a lot of land and George Washington is not the one out there farming it. And if there is a lot of land and a lot of crops, right? It's gonna take a lot of people to work this land, which means there are probably a lot of enslaved people living here, right? New Grange had the same idea that you had. Um, Mrs. Hort's class said a lot of land and farms equals the need for a lot of enslaved laborers, um, right? So now we can, by just looking at this map, we can start to understand the size of the operation. And when we understand the size of the operation, it's telling us more about the size of the enslaved workforce that is pulling through that operation. And as we learned earlier, that's 317 individuals when George Washington passed away. Um, I'm trying to look for other comments because I saw some really great ones um, here in the chat. Other things that this farm can teach us. Somebody noticed George Washington's house on the map. Right, and it was one of the the kind of black square boxes. Um, do we see those boxes anywhere else? Do we see any more type of structure like design anywhere else within the map? Um, and if you do see it, where are you seeing it? I'm seeing Gus said yes. Um, George mentioned he saw it on Union Farm, right? And that's a really great piece, right? We see some here, they're above Union Farm. And if these are buildings, um, if, you know, the black box that we saw was George Washington's house, what do you think we can assume about these other kind of black boxes drawn in the same way on the rest of the map? Okay, a lot of you are seeing, yes, they're on Union Farm. So if we're seeing these pop up at different spaces, um, what do you think, if we know one is Washington's house, what do you think we can think about the others are? As some, and Michael and Caitlin saw this one here on River. Um, let's see, okay, so LMS seventh grade, or seventh grade said they could be houses for enslaved people. New Grange said they could be slave quarters. Um, who else did we have? And you guys are exactly right. Um, places where the enslaved people live, Birchwood Blue Hills, home for slaves or barns. Um, yes, and you guys are absolutely right. That's what these buildings are. So these buildings are marking either. You can answer another question. We're finding out that these buildings are either living quarters or working spaces for the enslaved people. And you're right, their home, their cabins or their barns. Um, and, um, and as we can see, they're not close to George Washington's house, but they're close to the fields. And so by looking at this map, we're learning where enslaved communities were put, where houses and multiple cabins were put, and we're finding out that it's by the places where enslaved people worked. That's how families were decided where they lived. Um, Washington and the overseers were in charge of making those decisions, and for enslaved people, they lived by where they worked. Um, it doesn't matter where their family was. Um, most of the time, families were together. Sometimes they were not if um, individuals did different jobs. Um, but the main point was everybody lived by where they worked. So these cabins that we see here in the block on River Farm, those would have been the cabins for the enslaved people who were working in the fields. Um, Along with George Washington's home at, Ma at Mansion House Farm, we see other buildings. That's where a lot of industry took place. So think the blacksmith shop, carpenter shop. Um, there was the smokehouse, um, the gardener's home. Um, and so, uh, and also homes for the enslaved people who worked inside George Washington's house. Um, so those are the buildings that we're seeing on this map. Um, so even though this map is not explicitly designed to teach about slavery at Mount Vernon, there's so much great information that we can pull from a lot of where enslaved people lived, where they worked, and kind of judging by this, 
what kind of work they were doing. And if I take you back to my PowerPoint here, okay, I can show you what some of those cabins would have looked like. So for the enslaved people who were working out in those fields at Dove Run and Union Farm and River Farm, like we saw, um, their work days were Monday through Saturday, sun up to sundown. So in the summer, those are extremely long days. Um, and they lived within these kind of quickly built cabins. Uh, the enslaved people were in charge of building the cabins um, at the locations that they were told um, they would be living by the fields. These cabins would hold between um, two or 12 people. So they were single family homes um, with a floor downstairs and then a little loft upstairs. Um, their rations throughout the week, so the food that Washington gave them was dried fish and cornmeal. They are very meager rations. That is not enough for people to survive on. So a lot of the enslaved people um, had to supplement their own diets. They would hunt um, for deer or rabbits, squirrels. Um, they would grow their own gardens. We can see here, um, this is the tip of a little garden. And so fruits and vegetables would be grown. Enslaved people also kept chicken coops. Um, for the eggs, but also the protein with the chicken. Um, and I just had a really great question popping in, and it's would the enslaved people be paid for their work? And they would not. Um, at the institution of slavery, they are not paid for their work. Um, they are looked at as property um, under George Washington. And so their work is not paid for. We do have some examples of the enslaved people being paid for extra produce that they've grown. Um, Martha Washington purchased cucumbers and eggs and some potatoes from the gardens of enslaved people. Um, it was at a very lower price, but to serve within the kitchen of Mount Vernon. Um, and so uh, we do have some examples of, in, of cash exchange. Um, and then the enslaved people would use that cash to buy things like the chickens or to buy special things to them since it wasn't a lot, but like a shoe buckle or a plate um, or something that they might need for their family. Um, another form of living quarters that enslaved people would live in were these bunk houses. Now the cabins were on the farms that we saw and these bunk houses were close to George Washington's house at Mansion House Farm. And um, these were for the individuals who were working in the workshops. So the blacksmith shop, the carpenter's house, and for the enslaved people who were working inside the house. Um, since it is very far distances between the mansion house and those other farms, um, they were not within those large cabins. Um, and these barracks could hold roughly about 20 people per, um, per room. So there'd be multiple people per bunk. Um, and they were very close to the kind of workspace area and the mansion house and were on call as needed. Okay, you guys are having so much great information pulled from this. Um, next thing I want us to do is I want us to look at the excerpts of a diary. And this is a diary not written by an enslaved person. It's actually written by a visitor uh, from uh, a visitor to Mount Vernon from 1769. Nope, nope, 1796. Um, he was a friend of George Washington's nephew. Um, this is from his diary, and he's explaining his visit to Mount Vernon. Um, again, just like in our source before, slavery is not going to be mentioned explicitly, nor is any individual enslaved person. But as we look through this, I want us to see what can we pull from this source that tells us, you know, how can we read between the lines here and pull information and understand more about the institution of slavery at Mount Vernon. We've already seen kind of the fields and the work um, in the map, but now let's look at this. Um, and Benjamin Latrobe writes, having alighted, so having arrived at Mount Vernon, I sent in my letter of introduction and walked into the portico next to the river. In about 10 minutes, the president came to me. 
there are only two people mentioned in this passage. Benjamin Latrobe saying that he sent his letter and President Washington coming out to greet him. But what are other ways, what is this passage telling us about slavery? Are there other people that he's mentioning without mentioning them by name? I'm waiting for some answers to come and it looks like, so how, how, what are other, what are ways that slavery is mentioned in this one sentence that we're not really seeing it? And so I'm seeing Piscataway Magnet School said, who did he give his letter to, right? Um, Mrs. Bartell's class said he's probably sent the message with an enslaved person. Madison, Jr., would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, it says that he sent his letter of introduction and that has to be sent by a person and he doesn't specifically name a person. So I'm guessing that that person would have to be a slave since they didn't usually name slaves. That's yes, absolutely. Edgewood, what would you like to add to that? Because you are absolutely correct. Um, when it says in about 10 minutes, when he sent the letter, I think a slave had to go get him and tell him that he was there. That's, yes, that is a really great pickup on that, right? So who greeted Benjamin Latrobe at the front door? If it wasn't George Washington, because George Washington, right, comes 10 minutes later, it would have been an enslaved person. So somebody is at the door to let people in, to take their letters, and then they have the responsibility to go find George Washington and alert him as to who is there. So they do have access to George Washington. So I really think, yes. So you guys are all picking up on this. Um, this is a simple sentence. This is a very simple sentence. It says dinner was served about half after three. That seems like a simple sentence. Um, how does this touch? on slavery? How does this, you know, what questions can we ask ourselves or what can we think about? Trillium, what do you yeah, think? I, uh, um, slaves had to serve like the dinner. Right? It just says it was served, was, you know, but that's right. Who's doing that physical oh, serving? Edgewood, what did you want to add? Slaves had to make the dinner right? Dinner just can't come to you. Dinner can't just come to people. Right? It has to be cooked. It has to be prepared. Cove School had that same question. Who would have cooked it, right? Gus mentioned that the enslaved people must have served and cooked that. Um, yes. Let's see. Um, and I think I have one other, and I want, because I have a picture of the kitchen, Right. And so this this sentence is so simple. I'm going to kind of zoom forward a little. This question, this sentence is so simple. Dinner was served about half after three. That makes it sound like it was easy. Right. That food just appears on the table and it's done. OK, but if we look, if we skip ahead. To this, if I say that this is the dining room. Okay, now, what are some things you're thinking about? preparing for dinner. Okay. Okay. Does this look like an easy room to set up, right? Ooh. LMS said they had to set the table, right? Does this look, um, Michael and Kaylin said someone had to set up the room. Edgewood, what did you want to add? Uh, I believe the slaves might want to meet to set up the table, get everything nice and decorated. Absolutely. Madison, what, what would you guys like to add to that? Making a dinner for like one person could be easier, but for like a room full, that could be a lot harder and it could take more people. Exactly. I think that's a really great thing to pull out is that it's not just about setting up, but look at the amount that has to be set up, the timing that it might take. Trillium, what, what would you like to add? They would have to polish all the silverware and dishes and plates and everything like that. They would have to wash the table. And right. they have to shower. 
right? So now we're thinking about the prep work that comes from it, not just for the actual meal starting at 3.30, but how much goes into setting up. Um, Mrs. Bartell's class said the room looks so pretty, but it takes a lot of work. Um, Delphin mentioned the candles have to be lit, places, silverware set, tablecloth spread, food brought to the table, um, cleaning dishes took longer than it does today. That's very good point, Pollywog. And so as we're looking at this, what can we infer, not just from how much work it took to set up the table, to place out the china, but what can we think about the skill level that was needed for this, right? If I tell you that everything cooked on that table was cooked in a kitchen like this, more so than just thinking about the work that was done, what can you think about from the quality of work? Okay, all right, let's see. Um, Giard, I'm sorry if I'm getting your name wrong, but he, um, but they said that they would have to have it make it look fancy, right? It's more than just putting out food. Um, Michael and Caitlin said you would need highly skilled individuals. Um, Madison Jr., what would you guys like to say? They would have to be like really quick at it because they might also have to go back to the farm and do their work there. Yeah, well, so, and so, right, so we mentioned that um, since these people are in different areas, right, so these cooks are really mainly staying in the kitchen. They're cooking with food that's brought in from the gardens and wheat from the fields, um, but you mentioned that skill, right? They have to be very skilled people to cook the food. Mrs. Hortzclass said it would be hot in that kitchen. They have to be able to sustain themselves throughout that heat. Um, and think about it, and they have to be very skilled and gentle to handle the china and clean the china and know how to store it, know how to make sure that the silver is polished very brightly, um, right? Robinson Elementary said the kitchen is also outside of the house, which makes it harder to bring in and out of the house, right? So there's a lot that goes into it that we can really just from Five simple words, dinner was served at half past three. There might be six words. That one little sentence, but look at how much information pertaining to slavery we can really expand on when we read those hidden stories that are in there that are connected to it. The last thing I want us to talk through is this. So this is an archeological artifact. Somebody asked a great question about the kitchen. Where did the dinnerware come from? So the Washingtons, because of that Potomac River and their access to Washington, D.C. and other trading ports, and because of the money made by um, the work of the enslaved people on the plantation, um, the Washingtons were pretty wealthy and were able to purchase China uh, or, and dishwares from China them itself, um, but also from France and England. So they would have come from everywhere. Okay, and Mrs. Horde had a very great point that notice there are no cookbooks in that kitchen, right? There are no cookbooks anywhere. People are learning how to, these individuals, Lucy, Hercules, um, Nathan, those were some of the people who were the enslaved cooks. They are, they are cooking from memory. They are cooking from skill. And that is something very important to think about. But back to this. Um, somebody mentioned, is that a ball? It is a ball. And I will show you that since you can see CM, that means that it's a centimeter. It's a very small ball. I will tell you right away, it is not anything that you're throwing at someone as any uh, ammunition. Um, it is a marble. Okay, it is a marble. Um, and this was an artifact found. Um, this is actually, we find many marbles um, within our archaeological digs, um, and we find a lot of them by the enslaved cabins. Okay, um, so it's a marble. It's a simple little toy, but why is it an important artifact? How, this doesn't even have any words on it. How can this marble teach us about slavery, about the institution, what is it showing us? Trillium, let's have you answer. The slaves could have played marbles for entertainment. 
right? The enslaved people, they would have been playing with marbles. They would have had entertainment. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I'm looking at Robinson Elementary said it teaches us about what they did in their free time. Um, Gus mentioned that that means there must have been children, right? There must have been kids within the enslaved community. Um, they would have had toys. Um, Madison, what did you want to add? Um, well, I was going to say that um, they probably didn't have a they probably didn't have like a lot of time, like a lot of free time because they were mostly working. But this is one of the things that they did in their free time, like a toy. Yeah, it shows us any activity because when we see this marble and you're bringing up free time, right? When we see this marble, what do we think about? Do we think about work? Do we think about play? You know, what does this idea of seeing this toy, what kind of feelings do toys um, evoke for us? What do we think about when we see toys like this? Um, right, people were talking about, they're thinking about play. Like when you think about things like that, what kind of feelings are coming, okay? Robinson Elementary saying happiness. LMS said happy times playing. Woodrow Wilson School said joy, joy. Trillium, what what would you like to add to it? Excitement. Excitement, Excitement right? You're excited. Maybe they're playing with friends um, or families. Birchwood said freedom to play, right? There is freedom. Edgewood said it shows how basic their games were, right? Games were simple. They didn't have electricity or batteries and have all the shiny lights that we might have. Um, but that it's still something to play and be joyful. Um, and that it's small enough, um, Piscataway said, to carry around anywhere you go. Um, and this is true. And when we talked about in 1799, when George Washington died, um, and there were 300 enslaved people living here, 28 of them were under the age of 14, um, living and working around the area of Mansion House Farm. Um, enslaved children reached the age of adulthood at 11 years old, and that's when they were given their first jobs. Um, and so, you know, as we talk about slavery, it is a very hard life. It is a very um, demeaning institution. It's meant to take away the humanity of others. Um, but as Mrs. Hord's class said, children are always able to find a way to find joy and play no matter their dire situations. And that's extremely important that when we think about um, resistance to slavery, and some people did put in the chat, they asked if, people ran, if enslaved people ran away from Mount Vernon, and they did. Um, there were accounts of people like Ona Judge and Hercules who successfully ran away. Um, and then there are accounts of people who tried to escape and were caught and brought back. Um, but that's not the only way that enslaved people resisted the institution of slavery. Okay, Other ways they resisted were pieces like playing games and holding on to that humanity um, and passing along family traditions to each other and telling stories um, and really fighting against um, that demeaning practice. And so that's why it's really important to understand these types of objects and what we can learn, right? There was joy, there was happiness within these families, right? Slavery is an institution of violence. There is punishment. There is family separation. And so simply the act of coming together, holding on to each other and supporting that joy throughout is a very big piece of resistance. Um, so I'm just gonna whoop, put that last slide up there. Um, and so I'm glad that we were able to look at this and understand how even though written records may not be there for all people who were enslaved, um, there is still so much information that we can pull out from lots of different types of sources to really understand the power of their history and their legacy. So I hope that looking at these sources kind of sparks um, 
you know, some ideas into your mind about the difficult conversations or perspectives, the narratives, the legacies of people like Hercules, um, like Ona Judge, um, and that we may not have their accounts, but we have the ability to still learn about their legacy. So I see Therese waving at me and other classes. And so I just want to wave back and say thank you guys so much for participating. I hope you learned a little bit more about the institution of slavery at Mount Vernon. Um, I very valued your input, your insight, and I hope to see you again at one of our other presidential primary source programs that we put on this spring.